It is good to give thanks to the Lord. He is so very good to us, granting us everything that we need, loving us eternally, taking care of our future, hearing our prayers. We give thanks to the Lord. I'm glad that you're joining us here at Treasure Lake Church today. We want to be a people that really have grateful hearts, hearts that grow more appreciative all the time, hearts that pause and say, God, since every good thing comes from you, I have a long list of things to say. Wow, I appreciate so much that you are thinking about me, giving me this relationship, this friendship, allowing me to enjoy this life, taking me through hard times. God, we thank you. Today, as we give thanks to the Lord, I realize that uh, as I'm recording this, that there's a group of kids that are coming back from a great outing called Reverb. They're probably dead dog tired, but I sure am grateful that they had a chance to go down there and to experience something exceptional and to find that God's love for them is great. I appreciate all the people who made that happen, our youth sponsors and those who plan those awesome activities. I'm very thankful for people who say the younger generation matters so much. May they hear about the love of Christ and experience the grace of God. I'm thankful to be part of that community. I'm thankful that I'm actually looking forward to uh, the next church board meeting. Don't talk about those things a whole lot, but uh, what a great thing to have an excellent board who operates in unity, who seeks God's face, and who moves forward in faith. I'm thankful that we get a chance to worship together and love each other and that God is planning on using us to extend his kingdom all around this area. May God be praised. I'm thankful that we're connected with missionaries all around the world who are sharing the gospel, who are showing the love of Christ. I'm thankful for the reach that we have through sending out uh, Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes to kids and to say, you are loved by the King of Kings. God has so many good things for us. And I'm thankful that we can pray for our friends, that uh, Clayton will recover well from his procedure, and that uh, a Debbie who has an operation coming up, that that would go very well, that God would remove the cancer that many people are fighting with, give Natalie a transplant, and help some people through some very difficult circumstances. Let's, let's go to our Lord and thank him. Dear Heavenly Father, we are very gracious that your goodness, your mercy, your kind intentions to us they show up everywhere, and we want to thank you for your kind intentions to the youth of this community, and we thank you for those who are dead dog tired right now because they've had such an extraordinary time at Reverb. Bless their hearts. I pray that the seeds that have been planted, that they would, they would form root and grow, and that uh, those kids would be able to say, I cling to my Jesus. He's mine. I know he's true. I know he's the Savior, and I know that he's powerful to forgive. Lord, give them conviction all the days of their life, and may they walk in your ways. I thank you for those that accompanied them and for those that planned these occasions. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the way that you are ministering to the young people of this community. Thank you for helping Clayton through his surgery. We pray that he would heal up just great. We thank you for hope that's attached with Natalie. We pray for a new transplant. We're thankful, Father, that there are many people who we have been praying for because they've battled with cancer. They've had really good reports lately. And, Father, there are some that are in a battle of pain and the consequences of, their, of the treatment. It's just really hard. We pray that you would strengthen and help their body to respond and, and to overcome. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank, we're thankful that you are strengthening Doug and Jim. We pray that you would, that you give clarity of thought to Rich and Bob and Joanne and Kim. Thank you that you see all the days of our lives and you know how we can invest well in your kingdom. May we do so for you and your glory. Thank you that you care to hear our praises. Thank you that we can sing. And thank you that you are showing us the truth. May we know it and continue to believe that it really sets us free. Bless this country, bless our church and the churches of this area. May we pursue you well and become like your son. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Praise the Lord. His mercy is long. It's stronger than darkness. New every morn. Our sin.
His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Hey church family, I've seen it in Walmart. The essentials for pumpkin pie, the fixins for making stuffing, and even eggnog showed up this week. The season of celebration is coming and time with family will arrive soon. TLC is doing it too, getting ready for the holidays. So please remember the due date for returning the boxes for Operation Christmas Child. It's next Sunday, right after the 11 a.m. service, your boxes will be on their way to the ends of the earth. We are praying that hearts will be touched and lives changed because of your generosity. On behalf of all of us, I just wanna say it out loud. God bless Samaritan's Purse for making all of this happen. It was a sweet, Thanksgiving is getting close. The way I see it, you're probably going to have a great time with family around a dining room table, or you're going to be here to experience the taste of Thanksgiving. Remember, all you need to do is register online and let us know that you are coming. If online isn't your thing, we do have a sign-up sheet at the welcome desk. I can promise you there is a warm, inviting atmosphere just waiting for you to join in. Dinner's served at noon. Remember that Get Fed and our Bible studies happen this Wednesday and next, but then with the many special activities of Thanksgiving, we will not be having Get Fed and our youth group on the day prior to Thanksgiving. Tuesday, December 3rd is our next blood drive. Are you an advanced planner? Are you one of those people who has already noticed that in less than 50 days, we are welcoming in the year 2025? It almost begs that we ask a question. Will 2025 be a special year as we mark advancing a quarter way through the 21st century? Will it be a year that we express our deepest convictions and grow in God's grace? I bet that's God's plan for us. The plan of TLC is to make 2025 the year of the Bible. Have you ever read the Bible all the way through? Have you ever tried to do so in a year? In 2025, we are going to give this a try as a church. For you advanced planners out there, we want you to know that there are going to be great things coming our way in 2025. If this is your first time with us, thanks for being here. We welcome you. Please find the welcome card in the pew in front of you, fill it out and leave it in the basket on your way out of the sanctuary. You've, uh, you've seen how we as a society love to track all sorts of things. We track the number of three-point shots that are made, how many downloads of a popular song, sacks on a quarterback revenue of a company miles to the gallon. We track things like what's the most profitable poker hand that's ever been played. We track things that are hard 
to measure like consumer confidence and yet we have constant readings on that. We're people who track thousands of things and perhaps it leaves us a little surprised on what we don't track as far as I can see. We don't do a good job tracking the size of people's hearts. We do notice that people have big hearts and we're so impressed when we see it. We see that person who, when they see a need and, and there's a student who's struggling to understand things, they, they take their time and they volunteer so that student can uh, keep up with the class. We see people who hop into vehicles and they drive all the way down south because a community was ravaged by a hurricane. We see people who literally they have a circuit of individuals that they go and they visit in order to encourage and strengthen and help them in very practical needs. We see people with really big hearts who when they ask the question, how can I help, they really mean it. And when we see people with those hearts, I think that we admire them and we find their heart to be beautiful and we are inspired by their heart. I I think that uh, those hearts of the people, they've affected their schedule so very much, and it's affected a lot of what they do with what they have. And if you were to ask that person, so what sort of time and resources have you invested just in caring for other people? Most of them would say, I have no idea, because I spend my time keeping my eyes on the horizon, because pretty soon there's going to be another need that will appear. They have big hearts. When I think about people with big hearts, I believe there's a principle that uh, applies. The bigger the heart, the more often it breaks. Now, I don't have statistics whereby I can confirm this affirmation, but I honestly believe that it's true. People who have those really big hearts, they've developed a radar system that identifies the hurting, the injured, and the disadvantaged. And, and that radar system doesn't just identify them. It moves toward them and says, how can I help? And as it moves toward the pain, great is the possibility that some of that pain and concern and burden might be transferred. And a person with a really big heart says, that's okay. I, I'll take the pain and I'll pick up the burden. Just how bad can it get when someone really has a big heart? Well, they start saying things like this. Um, I wish that it was me rather than you. I would take your place if I could. I would, if I could, endure the pain and the consequences of the symptoms of your illness. I I, I would step in and, and adopt those if it was possible. I wish I could be the one who is devastated rather than you. I could... Bear, if I could bear your pain for you, I certainly would. That's how much I care for you. You know, a mother or a father that has a young one who's going through such pain, it is no effort on their part to say, boy, I wish that I was the one hurting and not them That is a sincere thought that comes from people who have big hearts. The beauty of the heart is that the heart can grow and love can expand and compassion can swell and all of a sudden we could find ourselves being so much caring for other people and and those who care greatly, they say those words, I would trade places with you if I could and I just love the people who say that. I admire them. I I want to be like them and I want my love to affect my decisions and my direction. And there is great evidence that the Apostle Paul was a person who really had a great big heart. And I'm not quite sure if there's a text in Scripture which will showcase that more than the verses that we're about to read in Romans chapter 9. We're going to be beginning in verse 1 in which Paul says this. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And Paul is saying, my goodness, my heart is breaking. It's torn apart. I have great sorrow I have unceasing grief, and he tells us why. It is because I have 
brothers that I share the same blood with, people in my nation, and they have chosen to not trust Jesus. And because they haven't trusted Jesus, the great advantages that Jesus wants to give them, they don't have that. They are distant from God. They are enemies of God. They do not experience the blessings of God. And what Paul understood was this, is that, well, they are a chosen people, but they have not personally chosen to believe in Jesus. And this is breaking Paul's heart. And it makes sense to me that Paul's heart is breaking over this because Paul knows how wonderful it is to know Jesus and to be forgiven and to say that there is a Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. For Paul knows that the law isn't enough, and our own striving isn't enough, and yet he has people who haven't found Jesus who is more than enough, and therefore his heart is absolutely breaking for those people. It is the heart of Paul that is breaking, breaking over the people that he loves. He has peace with God, and he wants them to have it. He refers to God with the title Daddy. He wants them to speak with him that way. And he is torn up that he has all of these blessings, and they do not. It is breaking Paul's heart. When I was a kid, I spent a long time, often, praying for Uncle Gerald. My family was blessed in that most of the members of my family, they believed in Jesus, they read the Bible, they trusted God to to lead them, they wanted to walk with God, they honored God, and they cared deeply about God, most of the family, but there was one person who had made it clear, Uncle Gerald, he, uh, he said, no, I've got too many questions, there's too many things that are uncertain, and therefore I am not interested in following Jesus, and I am not interested in spending my time worshiping God. I am not buying it. And uh, to be honest, I prayed a whole lot for my Uncle Gerald because it broke my sister's heart. Now, I'd love to tell you that I was the one who had the big heart and my heart was breaking for Uncle Gerald, but it just didn't turn out that way. I mean, I didn't lose sleep at night thinking about Uncle Gerald, but my, my sister did. She thought, how could this be that someone who's part of this family doesn't know Jesus and doesn't know his love and isn't forgiven by God Almighty? And, and so my sister prayed constantly for Uncle Gerald, and I'll be honest, her passion for Uncle Gerald, it rubbed off on me. To where when I was young, I think that I prayed for Uncle Gerald more than anyone else that I ever knew. My sister's heart was broken for those who were her kinsmen. The Apostle Paul had a heart that was broken for his kinsmen. It was tearing him up. And the Apostle Paul said this in these verses. He says, I would entertain... Trading places with them, if that's what it took. I would consider being accursed from God myself, yes, being rejected by him, if somehow that could change their eternal destiny. I care so much about them that I would consider swapping places with them in order that they could know what I know, in order that Jesus Christ would be their Savior. I would consider even that. Now, that may strike you as somewhat extreme language, but I think that Paul, as a student of the Bible, uh, he had someone that he admired who went down the same path uh, years ago, all the way back in Genesis and chapter 32, 33, Moses is having a conversation with God, and God is saying, I think I'm going to set the people of, of, of Israel aside because they've been so disobedient. And Moses said, Lord, Lord, I would prefer that you would blot my name out of the book of life rather than your name would be heckled and wouldn't be honored because people would say you haven't taken care of your, your kingdom. For my people, God, I, I would entertain that you would blot my name out of the book of life. That's how much I care about them. Moses and the Apostle Paul, I think that we'd all agree those are pretty significant leaders. And those significant leaders, they share this in common. Both of them would entertain trading places with those who do not know Jesus if it would bring them 
eternal life. It is remarkable what they thought. I'll be honest with you, I don't rub shoulders with a lot of people who talk like this, who bring up the subject, who seem to have their hearts broken at this level, that I would swap eternal places with them, for I love them that much. I think that the words, greater love have no one than this, than a man laid down his life for a friend. Paul is taking that to its logical conclusion, and I think that we find ourselves a little bit stunned that he would say these things. I think that his words rattle our cages, and it makes us ponder, how much does my heart love, and how big is my heart? And I think it makes us want to pray, God, grow my heart and grow it big. Now, Paul wants to describe these people, these kinsmen that he loves so much, and so he goes on to say a few things about his kinsmen. He had said, for the sake of my kinsmen, and who are these who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, the glory of the covenants, the coming of the law, and the temple service and the promises? Whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all God, blessed forever? Amen. Who are these people, his kinsmen? The Israelites, they have quite a pedigree, do they not? They are the chosen ones. They are the heirs of a special relationship. They are the ones who have received the divine law and instructions. They have the most important place of worship on the planet. The Holy of Holies only exists in Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant is only there. They are the ones that receive the words of the prophet. They have the hope of the Messiah. They have all of the advantages. And yet Paul says, but they are far from God and it is breaking his heart they're in a situation in which they still are facing condemnation and their situation is desperate and the truth of the matter is that those with everything had missed it all they had missed the words of the Lord they had missed the Messiah they had missed the coming of salvation they had missed it all And I think it's good for us to pause here and to ponder this. Those with everything can miss it all. You see, you can have access and you can have advantage. You can have front row seats to the truth. You can have an opportunity. You can have the wisest person in your family who was so incredibly faithful. You can know the truth, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily embrace the truth. You can know that Jesus died for someone, but not realize that he died for you and actually say, would you please forgive my sins? You can have theoretical knowledge about all sorts of spiritual things, But I tell you, if Jesus hasn't wiped away your sin, if he's not your Lord, then you're going to miss it all. We have heard so much. We have been given so much. We have front row seats to the truth, but the question is, have we embraced it? Have we trusted it? Is it what we live for? Is it our greatest belief and conviction Those who had everything had missed it all. And Paul is saying, I love those people who have everything, who God had given them adoption and the prophets and the right place to worship. I love them very much, and I'm very concerned about their eternal destination. And so I would consider trading places with them if that would bless them. You know, when a uh, parent is in a hospital room with that child that they love so very much and that child is suffering and there are questions that the child can't understand, that, that parent says in his heart a thousand times each and every day, I would take their place if I could. But that parent cannot do that. Paul is in the position of the parent saying, if I could, I love you so much, I would take your place. But no one can take your place except for Jesus. He is the only one qualified who can step into your place. And the most amazing thing is is that he actually did. He stepped into our place and he took our condemnation and he paid the price for us. He is the only one who can take our place and he is willing to 
to do that. Now, as Paul is talking about his breaking heart, he's uh, made mention of a belief that he has which is going to irritate plenty of people. You see, there's some people that are going to think that, hey, Paul, you don't really need to worry about the Jewish people because they're God's chosen people. Everything is all good with them. Why are you saying that you don't think that they're going to make it into God's eternal presence? Well, Paul wants to say that as far as he's concerned, bloodline is not sufficient at all for someone to spend all eternity with God Almighty. Salvation doesn't come via genealogy, and Paul wants to now argue that case, and so he does, beginning in verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. The fact that Jews are not receiving a passing grade and are just experiencing only God's graces because they're the prodigy of Abraham does not reflect negatively on God as if he has failed to keep up his end of the bargain. It is interesting how often we conclude that perhaps it's God who made the mistake and God's the one who has dropped the ball. There is no ball that has been dropped. The truth of the matter is that if anyone is thinking that physical lineage and genealogy is an equation adequate for salvation, they are so misguided they never should have had that thought cross their mind. And the evidence is absolutely overwhelming. We need to consider the facts. And here's the facts that Paul would like for us to think about. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. Paul turns our attention to Abraham, and yes, God gave a promise to Abraham, and the promise was that through Abraham, the people would be given a land that they would live in. They would be given God's instruction. They would be given a savior. They would have a status of being chosen. But you know what's true is that Abraham had more than one child, didn't he? Abraham had Isaac, but he also had Ishmael. Both are physically connected to Abraham. Both share his genetic code. Both have equal rights to call him father. But we know from the story that Ishmael was the consequence of Abraham and Sarah taking matters into their own hands. They were tired of waiting for God's timing, so they pushed their plan into a space that God was designing. And since God hadn't given them a son, they decided that the problem could be solved through a concubine and the consequences are very, very large. Now, what is true is that obviously in the Old Testament, the promises of God, they really flow through Isaac. I mean, Ishmael is part of the overall promises of God. He's part of the many nations that will come from Abraham. He's part of the descendants that will be as numerous as the stars of the sky. But, but the promise of the land and of the Messiah and of the law and of the coming king, that was given to one of Abraham's descendants. It wasn't given to both of them. And the Jews absolutely agreed that not every descendant of Abraham was central to the promise of what God was going to do. You see, the descendants of Ishmael, they did not take part in the exodus from Egypt. They did not worship at the tabernacle. They were not waiting for a future leader coming from the tribe of Judah. They did not read the Psalms, and they had no idea that there would be a Messiah who would one day be born in Bethlehem. Those were just the facts. And so the facts say this, not every physical descendant from Abraham is central to the promise of God. The sad truth is, is that some of the descendants of Abraham would spend their life and their kids would spend their lives and the next generation would spend their lives fighting against God Almighty, acting as if they didn't care at all. And so here's how history actually works. If all of Abraham's descendants are not part of the chosen people, and they certainly are not, 
think of Ishmael? Why would we think that all of Israel's children, that is the third generation from Abraham, will be part of God's eternal kingdom? Why would we think that? For Ishmael has already proved that more than genetics is involved, and if it's more than genetics, then what we're going to do throughout Scripture is we're going to be saying things like, well, Abraham had descendants, lots of them, but some were descendants of the promise and some weren't descendants of the promise. You have Abraham's descendants and Abraham's descendants. We're going to find that in Scripture we talk about the chosen people and the chosen people. You see, there's a group of people chosen by God in the Old Testament. We call them the Hebrew people. And that's not the only group because when we come to the New Testament, there's going to be people entering the group. You are a chosen race and a holy priesthood. And in that new group, there's going to be not just Jews, but Gentiles who don't convert to Judaism, who cling to Jesus, and they are going to be chosen as well. You see, there are chosen people, and there are chosen people, and So Paul is making this argument. He says, uh, that is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Abraham has physical descendants. What a great thing. But the promise does not come simply because of physical heritage. The promise comes for those who believe as Abraham did and who are reconciled to God And therefore, if you had to choose between being a physical descendant of David or being a child of the promise, you would absolutely want to choose a child of the promise. And Paul said, man, he's really lucky, Paul, because he got a chance to actually be both. Paul is so excited about how God Almighty is reaching out and choosing so many people. He wants to talk about it now. And in verse 9, he says this, For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Now, I have a feeling that there is a lot more color and texture in these words than what sometimes we might consider. So could we for a moment think about these two remarkable, significant women, Sarah and Rebecca? And I think that we could come up with a question that we would love to ask to both Sarah and Rebecca. And the question would be this, um, Sarah, could you tell me, Was there one day in your life that you felt might have been the most significant, the most important day? This was the best day that you ever had. I wonder what Sarah would respond. And I think that she might say, well, it might have been the day that God himself spoke about me. He actually declared a plan that he had for me. I was distraught because I had no children and I felt like it was going to be impossible. I couldn't have children. And then then God showed up and he promised that he would do a miracle and I would have a son in my own age. And guess what? That son, that son was to have a central part in God's plan. Now, the son that I finagled Abraham to have with his concubine and my goodness, do I ever regret that decision? What in the world was I thinking? He, he wasn't going to be central to God's plan. God's big plan was to pass through me, this old lady. Can you believe it? Why me? Why was I blessed to, after I had failed to trust God? I have no idea, but check this out. By God's will, by his choice, his great promise would pass through me and through my son all of the nations in the world will be blessed. That was my greatest day, and God did it. To which you and I would say, praise God. Praise God that he would bless Sarah that way. Praise God that he would have such a plan that he would use a simple person like Sarah. Praise God, may his will be done. Well, I think that we could ask the same question of Rebecca. Rebecca, 
Did you ever have a day that was maybe it stood out as the, the best day ever in your whole life? And I think that, that Rebecca might say, well, do you realize that, that God actually spoke to me? He spoke to me in Genesis chapter 25, and I can hardly believe that, that he had something to say to me. It was, it was just the absolute best day. He said that I'm going to have twins and each will be the father of a nation and despite the fact that they will be born on the same day, <clears throat> the one that arrives first, ordinarily, that would be the, the person who had all of the advantage, that one is going to actually serve the younger one. What is it that God Almighty said to Sarah in Genesis chapter 25? The Lord said to her, Rebecca, <clears throat> two nations are in your womb. And two people will be separated from your body. The one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. <clears throat> what an interesting piece of divine knowledge. Who in the world would come up with that but God Almighty, who sees all things, made a divine choice, and he chooses things that are surprising. He chose the younger of the brothers who were sons of Jesse to lead the nation. He chose Ruth to be part of God's divine plan, although she was a mere sojourner through Israel. He chose Mary when probably Mary had not done a lot to distinguish herself among all of her peers. And he chose Peter and John rather than Lemuel and Manasseh, who just lived one village over on the Sea of Galilee. And why did God choose all of those things? He chose all of those things because God wanted to. Praise be the name of God. Why did God choose us to live in this absolutely amazing country? Is it because we deserve it? Why is it that we have such access to his gospel? Why is it that we get to choose between 75 different Bible translations when some people don't have the whole Bible in their language yet? God chooses and his plan is remarkable now the plan that God shared with Rebecca was very interesting Rebecca I want you to know that there are two nations was the phrase that you will be giving birth to each son will have a nation and in talking about those nations said the promise of God the older will serve the younger how would anyone know that they couldn't but God would know that. Now with that said, we have now come to the verse that I think a lot of people consider to be about as <clears throat> pleasant as a, as a branch of a hawthorn tree that has vicious needles to it that scratches you dearly when it passes by you. We come to a verse that many people say, this one just bothers me. We have much to say about this verse. Paul then writes, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Do you feel the swipe of the hawthorn branch in that first verse that we read. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. There's a few things that we're going to have to talk about in order to read that text intelligently. The first question that we're going to have to ask is, because those words are in, are in um, quotations, where were those words spoken? Were those words spoken in the book of Genesis? No, they were not. Were they spoken in the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible that are attributed to Moses? No, they are not. No, those words come to us from the very last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, chapter 1. And the book of Malachi was written 1,600 years after Rebekah gave birth to those twins. I'd like for us to try to let that settle in. These words were written 1,600 years after the twins were born. To wrap our minds around a length of time of 1,600 years, if we were to roll back the clock from today, 1,600 years, the Roman Empire would still not 
have fallen. That is an extraordinary long period of time. Not only that, but the promise that God gave to Rebekah that the older will serve the younger is in a context in which God said, I want you to know that you are giving birth not just to two people, but to two entire nations. So know this to be true. When the words were spoken, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, that was not spoken in a context in which people were standing in a living room and these two little boys came and were playing on the carpet. That is not when they were spoken. Sixteen centuries later, after these two people groups had grown and grown and had made all sorts of choices, that is when those moments were spoken. And the truth is, is that Jacob serving Esau wasn't really something that happened much in his lifetime. No, that would happen later when the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, would find themselves in military conflict with King David. And because they would lose, they would end up serving the Jews at that point. And there were reasons why they would serve the Jews at that point, for they had strayed far from God. Truth is that archaeology tells us who was the God of the Edomites and Scripture doesn't even give the courtesy of naming him, but through archaeology we know that they served a god by the name of Kos. And this was the god that they wanted, this is the god that they followed, and therefore they had rejected the one true god. And having rejected the one true god, they met with the consequences as it says in the book of Malachi, this first chapter where we find these words, that the descendants of Esau, they are now in a wasteland and the home of jackals, for they have met the consequences of their rejection of God Almighty. That is the first part of the context we need to understand. Jacob, I love Esau, I hate it. It's not talking about two individuals. It's talking about two nations which unfolded over a 1,600-year period of time. And the phrase, I hated, is not quite what it sounds like in English. English uses the word hate in a very small, refined, tight definition the concept of the word hate used here, it's much larger. Jesus used it that way and shocked us in Luke chapter 14 in which he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, given all the passages we have of which we need to love our wives and love our children and love our family members, we're looking at a usage of this particular word, hate, as being more, mm, would not give that much attention to in comparison to. And therefore, the phrase, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, has a very different feel than what you might first conclude when you read those words. The truth is, is that the descendants of Esau for generations left God Almighty and they lived with the consequences and they ended up serving the descendants of Jacob. It was something that was rightly so. And what shall we say then? There is no injustice in God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have mercy compassion. God's compassion and his goodness, it was directed to Jacob. It was a wonderful promise. The Edomites, they dealt with the consequences of their actions and know this, that God Almighty, he makes choices and he chooses. Those words that we just heard, God saying, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. They are powerful words when they were spoken to Moses long ago in the book of Genesis. I think the words increase in power as we hear them now in the New Testament for those words tell us so much about our God. God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. What does the word mercy mean? Mercy is not receiving the punishment that we deserve. An officer might pull someone over and be ready to issue a speeding ticket and for whatever reason, due to mercy, might not issue that speeding ticket. The person deserves it, but they didn't receive it. That is mercy and God will give mercy to all of those whom he sees fit. We know this to be true. Justice is coming for all. 
Justice is coming for all, and there will be judgment for all, unless mercy is given. And how is it that God will choose to extend mercy to people? Well, it will be based on his criteria, not on ours. And God will choose. Now, I think that throughout the generations, there's been a lot of people who have wanted to coach God on how he should be using and distributing his mercy. There have been all sorts of thoughts that have gone like this. Well, God, I just want to tell you, I, uh, I think that you should distribute your mercy to those people who have been good. And they're the ones who should receive mercy. And to that, God would say, well, I, you know, I, I hear your opinion, but the first problem that you have is that n- no one is actually good. So, so that really wouldn't help anyone, would it? And then someone else will say, well, God, I think that you should distribute your, your mercy on, on everybody who was religious and spiritual. After all, they, they invested some effort somewhere in some higher power. And, and I think that God would say, so you want me to honor a group of people who their whole lives chose to not honor me, but perhaps honored some sort of false deity by the name of Kos? Yeah, I don't really think that that's going to happen. And there would be some people who would say, God, I think that you should offer your mercy to, to anyone who, who begs and says, pretty please. And, and so the thought would be so, just because you're being a little bit polite somewhere near the end of your days, you, you think that that should cover all of your sin. God has heard mankind coaching him on how he is supposed to distribute his mercy. And I think that what God Almighty would like to say Would it be okay if we turn this around? Would it be okay that since you're the ones who have broken my law and turned your back on the Creator, if you're the ones who deserve all of this punishment, would it be okay if if I happen to be the one who determines how mercy rolls out to everyone? I want you to know that I've already done that. You see, mercy is coming to you through a Savior, and He's my own Son. And I love Him more than anyone. And he's, He's given His life For you, that's how much I love you. And and here's the deal. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I'm telling you, it is coming to everybody who places their faith and their trust in Jesus. He is the way, the truth, the life. And no one's going to come to the Father but by him. I will have mercy. And I've already declared to you the mechanism whereby I have created the path, the merciful path that you can pursue. God will have mercy on those on whom he will have mercy. It will be his sovereign choice. He has chosen and his choice is good. And therefore it is within our own best interest and it is honoring to God if we pause and we say, God, what an awesome plan. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve this mercy, but you extend it to us and you have given it in Jesus. May you be praised that you have mercy on those on whom you will have mercy. And this is the ultimate choice. It is not the choice that you and I make. It is the choice that God makes. For he says, I have determined there is a merciful path of grace. His name is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Trust him with your everything and find the mercy of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for several things. We thank you that although we do not deserve any mercy, you have created a path and you have determined how that will be distributed. May you be praised. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, that you would choose to make Jesus and his sacrifice available to us all. Dear Heavenly Father, forgive us for coaching you and telling you how we think you ought to distribute mercy. And teach us, Father, to change our ways and to say we praise you that you decided to distribute mercy. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for ourselves because we would like to have hearts as big as Paul that breaks for his countrymen. For there are those who have access to the truth, who have a front row seat to what is right, and yet they do not embrace Jesus. And Father, we'd ask that our hearts would be broken for them. Father God, we pray that you would call them and that they would run to you and that they would find the mercy of the high king, eternal love, unending grace. Thank you, Father, for your call 
to all. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.